Okay. Um, from the Connecticut Humane Society, um, just to give you a quick overview, we've been around since 1881. We were originally an animal welfare and a child welfare organization. We currently have um, just animal welfare only, and we are three branches. There's our Newington District, our Waterford District, and our Westport District. Um, Newington is the only um, branch that has a full-time foster coordinator. We also have the largest foster program of the three branches, um, and we're currently doing all of the crisis fostering um, program now. The crisis fostering for us was, it's a commitment to our communities to make every attempt to help a family during a crisis or an emergency traumatic event, weather event. Um, we are working hard on, on being in no judgment zone. In other words, we are not, my emergency may not be their emergency. Um, and looking at everything as an individual and how we can help that individual or the, that family of pets out. Um, it can be you know, a sudden loss of a home, it could be fire, weather, uh, water, um, and we're looking to protect that bond as best we can. What's better than being able to keep that animal in their home where they belong after a family gets through whatever they're going through um, than to bring them in here. Um, how we're doing it. So we are doing that through two um, positions. We have a rescue transport and animal control coordinator. Um, she works with our clients in need, the people who are experiencing um, this event. So they reach out to an application <laughs> process. Um, she begins to work with them specifically on what their needs are, their animals, and how we can get them into our program. From my end in the foster coordinator position, I do all of the foster um, related business. I get the animal out to foster through their medical process. I communicate with the foster families um, for supplies, return dates, and she communicates specifically with the client um, that has the pet in need. And we do this in a way to help maintain and protect the privacy and confidentiality of both parties. I, I mean, this family could be going through a domestic violence situation, a home loss situation, and they may not want all of that information shared with the person who's fostering their pet and vice versa. So this allows us to maintain that integrity um, and whatnot. The Humane Society takes ownership of the animals. So the animals are signed over to us um, for that period of time that's predetermined. And we get them through the medical process. We give them the vaccines if they need to be spayed and neutered. We go through all of those type of things to get them ready for foster care. So they're up to date, they're spayed and neutered and, and they're behaviorally tested. Um, during emergencies, right, emergencies happen. We do make every attempt to reach out to the owner the actual owner of the animal to help us in making those decisions that may need to be done at that particular time. However, the Connecticut Humane Society retains the right, the right to make decisions if we're unable to reach that person during that emergency. Um, return to home, the timing, extensions, um, inability to reclaim and cost of care. How we do that is it's a predetermined um, day that is built into the contract. If the surrender is on January 1 and they feel they may need two months or three months, we usually add a few extra weeks to that um, and give that a predetermined pickup times. Um, they can reclaim their animal at any point during that, that period of time. If they're able to take their animal home earlier, that's great. If they need an extension, um, those are granted based on available resources. We have to have the foster resources in order to extend that. Um, if they fall off the grid, we have had a um, surrender or a family in need that fell off the grid. Every attempt was made to reach them their emergency contact for them to redeem their pet. Um, if failure to do that, the animal then becomes the property or we own that animal and we'll move that animal through to adoption um, if we're not able to reunify them. We give each family an estimate of the medical care at the time of redemption. This is not a bill and payment is not required. We do accept donations to help fund the program, um, but it just gives them an idea of what, what it costs during that, that period of time. Um, 
the roadblocks and opportunities. I, I, not every organization has a medical team or, or a department to offer that type of medical care, um, but bring our local veterinarians into the conversation. We're doing that now with boarding facilities where we're reaching out to all of these organizations to say, hey, this is our program. This is what we're doing and why. Are you able to provide us any resources? Um, we have boarding facilities and our local animal controls that are stepping up to say we can provide you know, 72 hours of emergency boarding. So there's, you know, um, an emergency animals are pulled from a home. We now have places to set them up for 72 hours until we can then work them through the regular foster program. Um, not enough foster parents to help. That is a struggle, I think, for all of us, especially when we're getting these animals in for crisis. They are typically not in the best shape or they're not at their best. So we're seeing them at their worst um, and we're struggling here as well to find the right foster homes for them. Um, but we're marketing the program. We're marketing it as the crisis program or a safety net program as its own standalone program. Um, we're looking for foster families specifically to sign up just for that. Um, they won't foster any of our kittens or our niche programs or our um, field trips or sleepovers, they strictly will be our crisis foster parents um, and available when we need them. Um, Staffing, I see staffing as an issue for us in the future. I assume it'll be the same for a lot of other organizations. So we're looking at how do we create a volunteer program or how do we create a volunteer um, staffing position, for lack of a better term, to get a volunteer and to help us through that application po you know, part, um, finding out more about the animal and getting them placed. Um, the financial impact we're finding is, is much more than we ever anticipated. Um, we do currently have a dog in a boarding facility now. Um, he's going into week three and we have been unable to find him a foster home. So we are now footing that bill for the boarding facility to keep that animal until we can reunite them. Um, we're fortunate enough here to have um, an entire marketing and development team that are fundraising and bringing in general donations and supplies and things like that. Um, so we ask for, in our fundraising, for um, funds specifically for that program and those funds will sit there for these type of emergencies so we can't find a foster but we're helping this family in need but now we have a way to reimburse um, the organization that's helping us out um, into the future, as I said earlier, we're working with our ACOs, our boarding facilities, our veterinarians to assess their ability to house an animal or animal short term during an emergency until we can find a longer term foster solution. We do not have an SOP as of yet. Um, we are working on creating SOPs for the program um, and as well as recruitment. Um, we created our contract off of our pet point um, database. So we took our pet point surrender document and we tweaked it to include return dates and things like that. I have documents that I'm, I'm happy to share with you. Our crisis foster application is online and um, paper as well so that anyone can access that document to fill out and submit an application. Acceptance into the program, of course, is based on resources. Um, and like I said, we try not to judge what what someone's need is. Um, data tracking, we are tracking a lot of different data. We're not exactly sure what data we want. So we are tracking everything we could possibly think of from um, you know, who's in need, the animal type, behavior, um, medical need, um, down to county and town. You know, are most of our efforts focused in one county in our state or are we seeing it statewide? Um, we'll refine that as we get further into our programming um, to see what information is really vital to the success of the program. Thank you.